Hey, uh, Nate's flying right now, so I don't think he's going to be joining us. Do you hear okay. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, sweet. Um, we should have maybe someone from the true level team joining us. I'm not sure. <sighs> All right. Well, we're recording, so whenever you guys want to start. It. Okay. Well, let's give it a couple minutes. Well, we have PZ4. Who's that? Ah, there's Michael Birch. Good. PZ4, who are you? Okay, well, maybe we can get rolling. Does anybody have any updates? Hey, I can start. Go hey. for it. Cool. Um, so I've taken a look at the abstract states paper that uh, I'm assuming you and Nate uh, wrote up. You mean in the last like, 24 hours? What? In the last like 24 hours? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I left some feedback on the Casper CBC Discord channel. Sweet. Um, it's all on the general chat, so take a look when you have time. Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to open that up now, but, but tell me more. <laughs> um, I think, well, I mean, I think it's pretty self explanatory. Um, yeah, um, just this general feedback. You know, as I wrote, I really love how compact everything up until 2.2 is. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I guess it, it looks very worked on, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, so the, I just want to re, so I've, I'm still working on handling cascading equivocations and I just want to bring up one thing Let me just bring up a screen share here uh, all right so Turn that down a bit. All right. Does everyone see that? Yep. Yes. So the, the noticeable part about this diagram that is different from it, maybe a lot of other uh, generated diagrams from the Python CBC repo is that on the left side, or the left validator has produced an equivocation because it's zero cool. and one blocks aren't, there's no dotted line between them. Mm -hmm. So effectively, um, one of them is not containing the other in its justification. And the third from the left validator contains both equivocations or both halves of the equivocation. And this means that it needs to somehow slash the, 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 the leftmost validator or else it's an invalid block itself. And I just wanted to point out that it doesn't quite matter whether you're including 
sets in your your valid or in your justifications, or if you're just using single blocks in your justification, you still need a cascading invalid block handler, if that makes sense. And, or I just want to make sure that that logic is, is accurate. Uh, and sorry, what do you mean by cascading? Okay. So assume we just do. So last time, if I recall correctly, Vlad, you, 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 you told us that, well, all you have to do is include sets in your justification to hand to. Oh, you mean like a dictionary from no from validators to the latest messages, which might be more than one if they're if, if they're equivocating. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's, that's definitely one way to do it. Well, so, and then you know you only need up to two because that's that's all you need to say that's an equivocation. However, the issue is that if the third validator here says, for example, that, oh, I've only seen, or if it only includes one half of the equivocation for the leftmost validator. No, well, that's invalid, right? That is going to invalid block. Except you have to detect that, right? And yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. So, and so that's not trivial in the sense that you might have to traverse down up to the number of validators. If that makes sense. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, I am, I am saying you have to traverse down. I'm not sure why up to the number of validators. I'm not, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, all right, maybe not the number of validators actually. However, you, you do have to traverse as in this. So for example, in this example, you have to traverse down two layers to discover um, both halves of the equation or both halves of the equivocation. Uh, yeah, like you have to go down to the the fourth validators block and then to the number one block. That's the that's in the fourth choice right now. And then you also have to look down the, mm -hmm. the justification to the second validator and then to the zero. Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so, so the Although I'm not sure that's the most efficient way to implement it, but that's whatever you do it has to be equivalent to that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I think I've come up with a somewhat not optimal, but okay way to handle that, which is essentially for each equivocation or starting, actually, we, we keep track of this invalid block list and we, we, we effectively make use of sequence numbers. And we say that after, uh, or we, we log when each validator for each invalid block has discovered that invalid block. And we log the sequence number that that validator has discovered it for. And then if anyone includes anything above that sequence number, it is just considered invalid. Uh, yeah, and then there's a separate equivocation blocks list, so to speak, where you record the, the base of the equivocation. So for this example, it's like this zero down here. Um, and then the for each validate, you record whether the, the, the sequence number in which it has discovered both halves of the equ equation, or sorry, equivocation or null, and then you discover, or when it has discovered one side of the equivocation or null, 
And if they're both nil, then it hasn't discovered either side, if that makes sense. And so that will, and then you can use that to update how the discoveries of invalid blocks and equivocations have progressed for each validator. Yeah. Cool. So were you looking for feedback from, from Vlad? Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I mostly, I was looking for whether I was doing something unnecessary or not, but I, I, it seems like, or at least from what I just heard, like, I'm happy that, uh, there, there needs to be something equivalent to doing that. There might be a better algorithm for it. Uh, for sure, but yeah, right. No, I, Vlad? Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. You're, uh, I mean, that seems kind of reasonable, but uh, you know, I'm still mostly in the math world, not in the implementation world, and so I mean, I haven't given this much thought. Um, basically, um, the, the 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 kind of the my first thought is, okay, if you have a strategy for efficiently keeping track of validators for your, for your own view, you could potentially just do that end time once, once for each validator and then kind of simulate them as you're receiving messages from them. Uh, sorry, as you receive, receive, as you witness them receiving messages in your own view. Um, and so whatever strategy you use to keep track of your own equivocation, I think could be used to keep track of other validators equivocations. Um, the downside there is basically multiply the overhead of that in some way by the number of validators. And so it might be, it might be a more efficient way, but, uh, you know, definitely not the, definitely not my area of focus. Cool. Uh, so, all right. Uh, I just, I just want to mention one other thing, which is, so. I've I've also been looking at the the pressure, so to speak, that constrains the number of validators on one shard. And so just to be really clear, the pressure to decrease is that is that the greater the number of validators, the slower the protocol proceeds, as in either like a higher overhead or higher latency to finality. And as the pressure the pressure to increase is the risk of centralization and the risk of catastrophic failures. And I just wanted to spend some time explaining the risk of catastrophic failures. Uh, the, in the in extreme case, we only have a few validators and each validator is staking a large amount of tokens. And since validators are staking a large amount, it is very unlikely that they will risk producing an invalid block. And if the costs of validating for an invalid block is high, and the probability that an invalid block would be produced is low, then it might be optimal for validators to never actually check for the validity of a block. And so we need to come up with a formula that takes in the various parameters I've mentioned and outputs whether or not the dominant strategy for the validators is to never check the validity of the block. And I think that's kind of the, the open question. I mean, uh, for, I guess, incentivization. And so one of the things that I think is hard about that question is part of the idea, I guess, behind proof of stake is that you have some monetary investment in the system, right? And if an invalid block is detected, say it contains a double spender or, or something, um, or, or like in, in 
arching parlance. It contains a forged, unforgeable name. Uh, that reduces confidence in the system, right? And so say if you have a million rev and you know rev today is worth a hundred USD, like you're you're doing real well. But if all of a sudden people are like, well, well, wait a minute, there, you know, we found a single instance of a of a forged name. How many others are there? We don't know. All of a sudden your your rev is worth like a penny each. And now you you sort of had a, a ten thousand times decrease in your in your value as a result of that, right? So part part of, or, or at least in my mind, part of the calculus is somehow like external and, and market driven and not just strictly internal things like how much does it cost to run hardware to, to be in the system? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, that I, I agree that the, the, the value of rev is, is, a pretty large parameter in this formula. Uh, I, although I don't, if you've looked at the 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 blockchain channel on the Archain Dev, I, I I do have uh, an interest or what I think is an interesting proposal. Although it requires, so let me let me just read it out. So if the if the costs uh, so. I think the the Archain cooperative should run their own anonymous validators Ooh. and then intentionally produce invalid blocks once in a while. And this will force validators to always be checking for such invalid blocks. And then when the those anonymous validators from the cooperative get slashed, their deposit will then be transferred to the validators who participate in it in the detection of the invalid block. Um, so, I mean, so like there, we have like a pro protocol for doing this without like requiring them to be foundation validators at all. Um, and you can give people the, you can, you can do, you can do private entropy uh, protocols where you can later prove that you have the right to produce an invalid block just as, and, and then, and then like just not get slashed. Well, that's pretty cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. But, it, but it's, it, I would say it's an advanced feature, you know, like pretty out there, pretty next level. And then you would put this information, the private entropy into your block header or just some arbitrary slot? Mm, well, you'd pre-commit to it when you sign up to bond and then you would reveal that you had the right to make this invalid block um, after someone slashes you. Ooh. I see. So, well, one thing I'm worried about. So, I, I, I mean, this is related to what what I've read from your paper. But you know how, like, you assume that uh, that f that equivocation fault handler function is monotonic. Like, as a result, when you have validator rotation or some kind of slashing like that, you can no longer assume that it's monotonic, right? And so I was wondering if there are ways to, or, or then you have to like redo the safety proof, right? Um, sorry, for, 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 for what? For validate rotation? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, like mm -hmm. equation 23 on your paper? One, one second. Um, sorry, no. I mean, you, do you have the most recent version? There's no 23 here. What? You mean 2.3? Oh no, I'm going by the on the on each equation it produces oh, the line line 23. Yeah, yes, thank you. Line 23. Yeah, the the equivocation fault weight. Yeah, so that function is monotonic, right? Mhm. Mm um well, I mean, so so it's good. I mean, it's going to be with value rotation it's going to be 
monotonic for every, for every validator set. I see. So, yeah, so the way to think about the validator sets is like they're each independent um, and that they're each, the one way to think about it is that they're each running an independent instance of this protocol. And then they have like just, responsibilities, they've got their weight of, contributes to independent blocks. And it's such that it nicely just carries over that yeah yeah it totally nicely carries over i don't we don't have the proof of that in this paper yet and i don't think it will i'm not sure if it'll ever be in this paper because the validator rotation solution that we have there for the blockchain isn't applicable for any value of consensus but um for any like you know possible things that we can have consensus on but um absolutely the safety proof like works in exactly the same way uh, and it was, like, and you know, one of the more more exciting kind of things that we've been able to do in the CBC framework, really. I see. So, I guess we're gonna have to make sure that. So you're 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 saying that we don't need the safety proof for with the carryover, or like we. No, I'm saying that the safety proof holds for every validator set. I, I see. And so the only work left is figuring out that carryover portion. Well, there's not even a carryover portion. There's just the, you just need to establish the fact that the weight of the new validators doesn't have an effect on the full choice rule and the blocks that the old validators choose between. So there's somehow just, just showing that the, that, you know, somehow like the fact that the weight of, of the validators that for deciding between the children of a block or given in a block, um, kind of, you know, precludes the possibility that any messages from other validators could possibly have any influence. I see. So it might, okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'll have to think more about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's something where, you know, I would love to have even uh, really pedantic proof written down, but, but, but I, but I am like, super confident from the intuition and from like just reasoning about it informally that that's how it is cool that's good to hear yeah the, the idea or like to try to phrase it another way is that if your validator rotation impact is only forward in time it can't affect anything that came before it right so if something that came before it was safe it is still safe. Yeah, the, 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 that's right. Uh, although instead of in time, we just need to think about the, you well, know, the time I, in the sense of causality, block ordering stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah something like that. I was just gonna say that's that's it with my updates. Sweet. I guess I can go next. Let's see. We got some. Um, I'm I'm trying to share screen here, but I don't know how to do it. There's like a green share screen button. Yeah, but it's, it's only giving me the option to share Windows and not my whole screen. Uh, one of them should be labeled desktop and, and not by a window name. No, I don't see any such thing. Are you on Linux? Yeah, I'm on Linux. Damn you. Um. Hmm. Anyways, um, here, here's a way we can do it. Hey, Ken, you said you have the latest version of our doc? Yep. Or I have the one that Nate sent you last Nate night. Published, yeah. Or like yesterday or whatever. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, great. So if you could, could you could you sh could you share that? Right. We'll do. Let's see. So basically, my main update is that I've been working on this document, you know, which like documents all of our key results. Um, 
there's there's a chance that I might disconnect. By the way, I'm having a little bit of power problems, but I, th I think it should be resolved. Well, um, just a heads up. And so basically, we've been we've been kind of working and like getting adding in all of the, the math and the language, and, and now we have things in a pretty pretty good order. Um, so we kind of we kind of went over this last week a bit. Um, the main change is now is that like we have like a lot a lot more clear language. So I guess scroll down. Um, the estimator doesn't return the empty set. By the way, it's an interesting one. Um, uh, you know, just that's just kind of an aside. Um, the 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 cool thing is that we have things kind of well organized now. So if you scroll down to the safety proof, um, so this is the spec. Um, it's it, this the spec is like okay. So the spec is done by proof by page three. Um, it's basically it's really kind of concise thing, and the safety proof is quite a bit quite a bit longer. Um, basically, there's two two parts. One which guarantee, which shows that like nodes have a common feature if there's not more than two faults by weight, and then another part that shows all of like our decision discipline and the and like proves the fact that decisions are going to be consistent. And um, we kind of do this by uh, by establishing consensus safety on decisions on safe properties of protocol states, and then by um, it's showing a nice relationship between properties of protocol states and properties of consensus that correspond to properties of protocol states through the estimator. Um, namely, if a here, let's scroll down a little bit. There's like this example that I think is great. There, oh, there we go. Uh, so, the, so for example, um, so so this is kind of this this way to translate a property of protocol states to uh, from a property of consensus. So here we give an example of an estimator for the binary consensus, which maps protocol states to zero and one, or just sets a subsets of zero and one. Um, and the property is going to map zero to true and one to false. It's one of the four properties of the binary of 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 the of bits. Um, and this natural property of protocol states basically will map a protocol state. To true if it returns the estimator with a set zero and false otherwise. Uh, and this kind of shows this, this kind of natural way to turn properties of the consensus and properties of protocol states. And we use that to kind of benefit from the consistency proof for decisions on properties of protocol states. Uh, and Lemma four is kind of cool too. It says that, oh, look, if the properties of protocol states that correspond to properties of the consensus are consistent, then so are the properties of the consensus. Um, and, you know, and then, and, 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 uh, like, do you want to scroll up to theorem four, please? This is just going to provide a little overview here. I don't really think we have uh, much hope to go through everything in detail. Um, Theorem four basically says that, oh, look, if there's not too many faults, then we have consistent safe properties of protocol states. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty straightforward proof, basically just applying um, the forward consistency lemma uh, once for every protocol state to show that all the invariant properties hold at the, at the state sigma, which is the comp, their comp, the, um, some common future state. And then because there is a state where all those properties hold, it means that those properties are consistent. Um, and, so, and, so, and so this is kind of like the thrust of the safety proof. And then the, and then we kind of could get to benefit from, from this proof for properties of the consensus um, through this kind of uh, fact that if the properties of protocol states that correspond to properties of the consensus are consistent, then the properties of the consensus are themselves also consistent. Actually, Vlad, while I guess we have you here, so one of the questions that I posted on Discord was, I didn't quite understand this, this the, the fact that, like, I, I, I sort of understand this idea that n-party consensus is a bit harder than two-party consensus because you could have consistent decisions pairwise, but maybe not as a group that's right yeah. 
I didn't understand the example here. Okay, so the example, I didn't like give all of the information in the world about P, Q, and R. All I, just, all I say is that P, Q, P and Q together imply not R. But how come you can assume that? So what I'm expecting is, well, like node one says something about P and then node two says something about P and node three says something about P and then. Oh, no, no, no. They, they, they don't at all need to say stuff about the same properties. You know, I was assuming that node one would be safe on P, node two would be safe on Q and node three would be safe on R to show this contradiction. How come you can assume arbitrarily that they're in some sort of relationship like this? Um, um, because I can construct properties that have these types of relationships, um, basically by, it's kind of like a truth table thing where basically like, oh, if I just set it up so that every time P and Q both hold, R doesn't, but so that there are states where P and Q hold and states where Q and R hold and states where R and P hold, then like I've kind of set it up. So you can imagine like a truth table with it as like, okay, we have P, Q and R on one, on like a on the left and then on the top of the table we have like a whole bunch of different states and we can fill them out so that like there is a state so that says that two of them are two of them hold but like there is no state where all three of them hold and in that case i would just be I would, like you feel like set up kind of by just like trivial construction that p and q and y not r so what i don't get about that then is even for like one node right Mm -hmm. The case that it's safe on P and safe on Q and safe on R. Yeah, of course that's not possible for one node. Did you say it's impossible for one node? Yeah, of course it is, yeah. How come it can't be safe on all three? Because there is no state where they all hold. I guess, hmm because they're inconsistent, right? So these are, uh, they, because they're inconsistent, they can't all hold the same state, right? Oh, so you're, I guess I'm having a hard time coming up with like a concrete example of like a safe property in which they can't hold, but. Um, so the, the point is that Sorry, are you kind of having a hard time coming up with like a consensus, like a value of the consensus where you can have these like two or three things holding but not three? Exactly. Yep. Um, you know, this, this shouldn't be too hard. Um, imagine like we're coming to consensus on uh, sets of numbers um, and these sets are all of size three and they all have at most two even numbers in them. Um, so like the values of the consensus are like basically triples where no more than two of the triples are even numbers. Um, and then like, it's quite clear if you're deciding on the first element of the triple and I'm deciding on the second and you're, and someone else is deciding on the third, but there is a way where we can, that we make decisions that could be safe individually, but can't be safe jointly. Namely that we all choose an even number. Oh, I see. In that case, though, why why are you allowed to be safe on one number? It, it seems like well, because it's possible that we because there's lots of so imagine if every one of these triples is a fixed point for the estimator, then uh, it's totally possible for the first one to be even, or the second one to be even, or the third one to be even, just not all three. Yeah, I agree. But like, if I feel like the definition of being safe means that when you choose, let's say you're in charge of the first element of the triple when you choose that number you know that it's okay because the other two weren't even no 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 the reason why you know it's okay is because you have common states common future with all the other ones as long as there's not too many faults and so you know that but like not because you've checked it not because you've seen their messages but because of the mechanics of safety in this context because of our guaranteed common future state so there's oh, no for us to, to all have even numbers and be safe on them and have a common future state. I see, I see. So it's it's kind of weaker because it, it just means that you have a common future. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that, that makes sense. So the common future will guarantee the consistency of all of our decisions, but we don't need to know about each other's decisions. 
at all. Like one node to be completely offline forever. And still we have this theorem hold. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that's cool. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Uh, anything else that you felt was maybe not clear? I felt like this conversation was super helpful. No, no, nothing else was not clear. I just, there, there's a bunch of nitpicks that I left on the Discord. Okay, well, you know, I'll take a look at those. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm pretty excited about the presentation. I think it's quite, quite clear. If, any, if anything, is a bit too clear. Um, in the sense of like, we just give like way too much detail in all the proofs. Yeah, I, I did mention that as general feedback that um, <laughs> I think the 2.2, like you've basically repeated yourself with 2.2.1 and then 2.2.2. It feels like no. you can cut some place out, if that makes sense. So 2.2.2, the only, the only things that's similar is the definitions of property and consistency and safe properties, right? There's like three definitions there that are somewhat repeated because they they have to be replayed for different values. But like theorem five and theorem four are different theorems. It, so if I understood this correctly though, they're both like informally speaking, it's it's the same as the the the, the ones above, except they're they're for sort of sub subsets in a sense, like consensus values are informally subsets of safe properties. Mm, pro properties of protocol states, uh, sorry, safe properties of protocol states that correspond to, to properties of the consensus are a subset of safe properties of protocol states. Yeah, so essentially the, 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 the theorems you've laid out are like specific applications of the theorem four, I believe. Yeah, theorem five is an application of theorem four, absolutely. Exactly. So th that's sort of what I mean, right? Like you've, as a result, it feels like you've you've repeated yourself. I I know it's different, but well, I mean, so somehow, like in theorem five, we don't even we we don't we use theorem four. We don't repeat the theorem four, right? Like theorem five, like the first line of the proof of theorem five is the application of theorem four. Yeah. Okay. I guess. I, I. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. I. I just felt that it. It. It seems like intuitive that it would just carry over. But of course. Yeah. I, I guess yeah, it's no, I mean, important I, that you put the proof. Yeah. I, feel, I clearly hear you. I mean, I, I. I. I feel like all of this could be explained in a few English sentences, um, but instead. Uh, I felt the need to lay out a detailed mathematical foundation. Yeah, fair. But yeah, I mean, I think the level of pedantry and detail may be excessive. Yeah, especially, I guess, yeah, if you want people to, like, use this as a reference, it's, I think, it, like, you, you might have a hard time convincing people to like go through the proofs, but maybe that's- Yeah, but, they, but, 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 but you know, if you read the English and look at the theorems that don't read the proofs, I think you can get most of the value out. Uh, and there's a, there's a kind of person who would go the proof, I think. Maybe uh, move the proofs to an appendix or something, or like yeah, maybe something I mean, so, so, yeah. So our, our, our kind of plan is to make this to, to kind of keep like a basically like a manuscript with like all of the details and then when we and then for like, you know, if we're going to make like a systems publication, we will write things as people expect in the systems in literature. And, you know, and that means that like probably these proofs won't be in here and probably there's going to be some hand wavy thing that like passes a proof in passes as a proof in those circles. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah to sense. where the proof is. Sorry, what was that? And a, you can give a pointer to where the proof is in case anyone is. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Can follow. Yeah.
So that's basically my update. I've just been working on that. Um, I think there might be some other updates. Oh yeah, Vitalik came up with a new safety oracle. Um, it's super cool. Um, I can try to describe it for everyone. I would love to hear it. So the way it works is kind of like this. So there's a, there's this notion of a span. Um, so for so it's it's, a, it's an operator that takes a block or a consensus value uh, or like a property that consensus, let's say, uh, a validator and it um, and it and, and it returns two two blocks or two messages which are consecutive messages from the validator such that um, they agree with that property. So um, two so we're looking for a, basically a clique of validators that have two consecutive messages. Each of them have two consecutive messages, each of which agree with the original uh, block that we're, we're asking about the safety of. And furthermore, it should be the case that um, all of the, all of the, so let's talk about blocks, right? Yeah. In, in the case of the blockchain, there should be a block that is between each of these pairs of blocks. So um, if we have like five validators, each of which have a pair of blocks, each of which agree, a pair of blocks, each of which are sequential for those validators, meaning that like, you know, they're the nth and n plus first blocks for some n from that validator. Um, and in between those blocks, there's a block in, each, in their chain. So meaning that if I follow the chain from the second block to the first one for each of the validators, I'm gonna hit this one block in common. Then we have safety for the, you know, uh, 2w minus 50 percent uh, the normal kind of clique calculation um, and basically it's it's kind of uh, an efficient way to check in some cases that something satisfies our clique oracle because if they are in this circumstance well they they all agree because all of these messages in the span these two these pairs of blocks agree and moreover because there is a message that's kind of in between those two blocks for all the validators, that kind of forces the situation where they all see their pre, their first messages, and because they're consecutive blocks, they both agree. There's no other message in between that they could see as like a new later message uh, that would disagree. And so, so, so somehow, um, um, we're gonna document this and maybe tell you guys about it in like much more detail next week. But the idea is. Um, if we have pairs of blocks that are consecutive that each agree with the value of the consensus and where um, there's this kind of bottleneck such that all of the that that the that, that the blocks are that so such that all of the second blocks see all the first ones um, then we have safety um, I don't know if I'm doing a great job uh, so maybe if someone asked a question that would help so one thing that's not intuitive is that it seems like the sandwiched block that needs to be from somewhere mm -hmm. else, it could be to that, uh, like the same validator each time. And so you wouldn't have, I like, I would understand if you, it required to go to like a unique other validator. So, okay, sorry. Let's say you have four validators in your clique mm -hmm. and and let's say, yeah, everyone, yeah. I kind of, I kind of also think that it's like that block is from like another validator that isn't in the clique, um, or either that or one of the this this key this kind of uh, bottleneck block. It could be actually part of one of the spans of the, and so therefore I need to somewhat soften the definition of the span so to not have to go surround this block, but like either surround or actually be that block. Well. Hmm. I, I don't know if I captured that, but I, I was thinking like, you know, in the example of like four validators and a clique, if everyone put their sandwich block to the leftmost validator, and then for the leftmost validator, they put it maybe to the second validator, then it seems like there wasn't enough weight from like the third and fourth validators that to 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 form the like the, uh, like to form that clique as a group, if that makes sense. Um, I don't understand, sorry. Yeah, okay, maybe you'll have to 
Late, write it oh, down. Or, yeah, it down. Um, yeah. So just like, you know, stay tuned. Cool. Anyone else have any updates? I've been thinking a lot about um, the Scott topology and how that might uh, present an opportunity for a Casper improvement. The, the what, sir? Scott topology that uh, Greg was talking about two weeks ago, I guess. Yeah, for, for validation, right? Well, the connection is. So, no. Yeah, I was talking about it in the context of verifying verifying the 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 transition function. That's what I mean by validation. Yeah. 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 Well, I was also, you know, thinking about these other um, consensus algorithms that are coming out that use some objective criteria for um, uh, always cooperate situation um, where they don't. Uh, are not uh, basing um, the decision on stake, but rather um, uh, some other value uh, that's objective. Um, uh, so what I was thinking about was uh, uh, the analogy of the Scott topology with space-time and how how soon one thing can affect another uh, is the shortest distance for light path. And um, uh, how uh, any choice that happens before that time um, is invalid, it doesn't happen and can be eliminated. Uh, and I um, uh, was thinking that um, having this always cooperate situation uh, would improve um, uh, the uh, 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 consensus which is an impossible problem we're trying to solve, but uh, essentially by having a light cone of possible effects, uh, we can make better informed decisions and uh, be more confident that the process calculus is being obeyed properly. Don't suppose you could write something up along these lines. I, I feel like ha having things written down is always more clear than having them spoken in a sort of, you know, spoken yeah. once and, and never talked about again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was hoping that I wouldn't have to do that, but <laughs> I'm not here. Uh, 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 to focus on the technology, uh, but consensus is uh, is my uh, uh, passion. So I guess I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Jim. Uh, any other updates? Cool. Well, I guess it's... Uh, um it's it's about the right time uh we got dev stand up in about four minutes yeah um hey uh vlad are you guys still in uh singapore yeah that's right okay i'm we're well, coming, I mean, I'm, least I'm coming next week uh oh, cool i'm actually leaving on saturday okay all right cool yeah too bad next time next time, next time yeah all right guys cool Cheers. next week then
Yep. Sounds good. All Thanks, right. guys. Yep. Bye-bye. Right, ciao.